Well, we've come down to Savannah in Georgia. Actually, we've come up because we've come up north from Daytona Beach this morning. And we've uh, a, la a lady called Sharon. We come into town, we're looking for a place to park, and she jumped out from behind a bus and said, hey, take one of our tours. $20 tour goes all around Savannah in Georgia. So um, we'll go and take a look. BB's new skill at map reading is coming in handy. The little feather floats around the steeple and then it drifts down and it lands out here straight ahead where you see the one-way sign. That's where Forrest Gump sat on the bench eating the chocolates. We have these squares throughout the city periodically. The locals call them outdoor living rooms. Yeah, we have 22 of these parks or squares here in the city of Savannah. Yes, yeah, Savannah, when Oglethorpe came over here, he had the template or the blueprint of Savannah already drawn out. We believe this pre-planned city was based on the ancient plan of Peking, China, which is laid out the same way in the grid pattern. Now, you know, the Civil War came here to Savannah in December of 1864. The city was invaded by 62,000 federal troops. They were brought down here by William Tecumseh Sherman, famous Union general from Ohio. He burns Atlanta to the ground. He cuts a path of destruction down through the state of Georgia. He was concentrating on destroying the economy, the infrastructure of the South. He believed that would bring a quicker end to the war with the Union victory. And that's the way he fought it, and that's a, that way proved to be correct. Thurman spared Savannah. Tonight, yes, yeah, shows 8 o'clock. gave him the option, but we're surrender all so Then we still now, have Savannah. Our founder, Oglethorpe, whose statue, the last grand mansion of Savannah was completed in the year 1919. Shipping magnate George Armstrong built this mansion for his wife and daughter. And the three of them lived there only eight years later. They moved up to North Carolina, and the home was donated to the city of Savannah. It later became the George Armstrong Memorial Junior College. And immediately across the street, we have a monument that honors the fallen sons of Chatham County that have served in the United States Marine Corps. And that beautiful fountain we have here in front of us, it was installed in 1858. And it's only three of them like it in, in the world. There's one just like it in Gibson, New York, one like it in Peru, South America, and one we have here. Yeah, 156 year old fountain. And it's sitting out here for Scythe Park. This is a 26 acre park. And I urge you to take a stroll around the park. You know, it's only one mile around it. Woof, Hodgins Hall. And then next door you have Magnolia Hall. Everybody loves this. Ivy steps, twin porches, chandeliers, mother-in-law cottage next to it. Oh, and down here you have a Corinthian columns on the county coroner's home. Yeah, that home features an oval porch there. And we're officially in the Victorian district. Queen Anne homes over here on your right. Oh, the yellow home down here, that's for Scythe Park Inn. That's one of the more popular bed and breakfast inns in Savannah. And across the street from it is a chestnut house. And you got the copper roofs there on the Tory porches and you have the wisteria. I love the wisteria. And over there on the left is a monument that honors the soldiers that fought and died for Southern independence. The Confederate monument was originally installed in 1875. Oh, and here's a police barracks from the year 1870. Our squad cars out here, 47 Chevy, 53 Chevy. They will fire up in a moment's notice, ready to go. <laughs> oh, and uh, we're about to cross over Habersham Street. Yes, oh, and down here, I gotta explain to you about the Spanish moss that's dripping down from the trees. Airborne plant that thrives off of airborne dirt particles, moisture, and sunlight. It's a member of the pineapple family. And it grows in Hawaii. In Hawaii, they call it Pele. And it also grows in Australia, down there along the, the uh, northern shore of Australia, as well as New Zealand. Down uh -huh. there, they call it old man's beer. But here we call it Spanish moss. It has nothing to do with the Spanish, and it's not a moss. And that's why we call it Spanish moss. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. But down in Florida, the orange growers don't like it too much. It'll kill orange trees. Now, not because it's a moss, but what happens after rain, Spanish moss will absorb 10 times its weight in water. 
Oh, yeah. And it'll break the tree limbs and the orange groves. It'll smother the trees. It'll kill the orange trees. But here it doesn't cause any harm. Yeah, these trees don't. That sermon stood on the steps in that church. And he addressed a crowd that assembled here. It was all freed slaves that had gathered out here to hear him explain what the Emancipation Proclamation was all about. And it was also here where he issued court field order number 15. This is where he promised freed slaves 40 acres in the mule. That's the church. On the little cottage up here in front of us dates back to 1845. Two rooms in the loft, 511 square feet, for sale. $286,000. I went up here in front of us is Washington Square. Now our first president visited Savannah in 1791. He was here to let us know how much he appreciated all the sacrifice and effort Savannah made during the Revolutionary War. Yeah, I'll remind you one more time, two of the bloodiest battles of the Revolution were fought right here inside the historical district of Savannah. Yeah, he was proud to know that this square had been named in his honor. Going up here in front of us, I gotta show you the old pirate's house. It's one of my favorite places to eat. And I wish the walls could talk. That front building over there where those people are gathered, that's the oldest standing wooden structure in Georgia. It dates back to the year 1754. Now they don't call it pirate's house or nothing. Pirates really used to come here during the cold winter months and hurricane season. They'd find room and board here at the pirate's house. Well, Robert Louis Stevenson, he heard some of the stories coming out of the pirate's house. He turned those stories into a book called Treasure Island. The beginning of the book takes place right here in this front building right here. This is where you're introduced to Captain Flint and Long John Silver. And all throughout the book, he refers back and forth to the port of Savannah. So you want to come here tonight, enjoy a good meal, or this afternoon come back and enjoy a good meal and read that book one more time, Treasure Island. Yeah, the old pirate's house. Yeah, you come here and you can enjoy a delicious meal, but there's also occasionally ghosts are seen inside that building. Yeah, all the most famous guests to stay here at the William Keyhoe Mansion, Tom Hanks and his wife were guests here when they were filming Forrest Gump. But notice the name on the awning, Cress. That later became Cresky. Cresky later became Kmart, there you go. And we're gonna let this beer truck get through. The ships coming here from England in those days were usually empty of freight. They were coming here to Georgia to pick up freight to take back home to England. They'd have to weight the ship down with ballast so it would flow correctly in the water. When they got here to Georgia, they'd have to unload the stones. Somebody had a good idea, why don't we pave streets? So that's what we have here. Oh, and the river here in front of us, it's 42 feet deep at low tide. Percent of all the ships in the world can be accommodated here in the Port of Savannah. And they go into our bridge over there with no problem. That bridge you see there, 185 feet above high tide. On the opposite side of the river there, you have the 16-story west in the end. Two world-class restaurants are over there. You know that Weston Inn, it comes complete with the World Championship 18-hole golf course. And the low building next to it, that's the International Trade and Convention Center. Oh, when you look across the river, you might be assuming that you're looking at South Carolina. No, that's not South Carolina. That's Hutchinson Island. That's all Georgia property. This is my favorite song. We gotta pause here for a moment. <laughs> I love it when people share their music with us. Well, some places you have certain expectations about, uh, and they live up to those expectations. Of course, plenty of times they don't. Well, Savannah is in the former. Um, for everyone, they obviously Forrest Gump. And then, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil with Kevin Spacey and John Cusack. Um, that's where I sort of first learned about Savannah and it doesn't disappoint, it is beautiful. The interesting thing is, this is the sister city to Charleston, South Carolina, which we're going to now, about 100 miles away, and they say, this isn't as good as Charleston. 
So it's with high expectations that we go down to Charleston. This is Madison Square. Uh, we drove around it earlier, but I did not get any footage of it. So we'll do that now. The statue in the middle of Madison Square is of Sergeant William Jasper, a Revolutionary War hero who died just over here, that where BB is, in 1779. There are 11 counties throughout the United States named Jasper County after him. This is another square, there's just one after another after another. I suppose for all intents and purposes they're the same. But I mean it's the height of midday and it's so shady in here. And Savannah's put on a stunning day for us. This is the mansion that Jim Williams used to live in. He was the subject of the midnight of the Garden of Good and in the Garden of Good and Evil, should I say, that was in the movie played by Kevin Spacey. Yeah, good movie too. Because there was a, apparently a murder committed there. Well, there was a murder committed in there upstairs. As to who did it, well, you have to read the book or watch the movie. She lives in a cracking spot. Looking west again this way. And we've got to wind our way back to the car. It's uh it's ridiculous, isn't it? absolutely beautiful 24 squares in uh, savannah and the one park 23 acre park foresight park yeah. with the amphitheater and the fountain yeah. we just haven't got time to do it all we only got a few hours here as we cross the savannah river whoop, we come into the great state of south carolina my 24th BB's ninth. So we're in the Carolinas, which is where we'll be for the next week or so. Next stop, Charleston. My favourite American chocolate. It's great cruising chocolate. No one else likes it, but I love it. Well, we jumped off the interstate onto a highway, as they call them over here. They're B roads in Europe, in Australia. This would be Highway 1 and uh, we're about uh, 45 miles out of Charleston, driving through some stunning countryside here in South Carolina. El Cheapo is actually a brand name. <laughs> Man, these parts, believe it or not. Let's tell you what, they're not talking about the BP. The old cheapo actually is only a cent de uh, cheaper than the BP. Go figure. This is our digs for the evening. The meeting place in Charleston. On Meeting Place Avenue. Complimentary wine, cheese, biscuits and dip. Very nice. Yeah? What is it? It's, good. it's got vegetables, it's got some onion in it. Slightly, there's something that's spiced, slightly pickled, that's been used in it. Because it's got a tang for that. Sorry? Artichoke, see these two. 
It is. It's very nice. Let's get into it. Very convivial. We're right in downtown Charleston here. We've got room 101, which is the closest one to reception, the forecourt, the bar and the street. The southern theme continues. Well, this place is just dripping with southern charm, as you can see. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that the cheese biscuits and dip were complimentary. The dip was warm, by the way, for those interested. And we'd be bound by egg. They use egg a lot with their cheese here, the bit of cheese in it. Um, a lot of rich Americans around Barbara's identified because they're all thin and they all look really, really pleased with themselves. Um, as Aussies, we're rich people, apparently, because uh, only rich Americans can afford to stay here. Now, I'm not going to tell you how much we paid, but it it's, wasn't 200, but it's more than 100. All right. If you want to know, you have to ask me personally. I neglected to mention that uh, we ate so much of the cheese dips and biscuit that we actually don't need dinner tonight. Uh, and we also get a cooked breakfast. So the price, you know, is all relative when it comes to that sort of stuff. It's coming down, put it that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, we've walked about five minutes from our hotel. BB's decided she needs something to eat and fair enough. This looks like an old railway building. Apparently it's full of food, 24 hours. Mmm, beer next to the orange juice. God bless some Americana. Actually, it's the same in Europe too. It's not just the USA. Australia's got some serious problems if they don't sell alcohol next to the orange juice. Oh, we found something we can eat now. Sandwiches, I'm so poor. Four bucks at something at home would cost eight or nine. Toasted subs, there, yeah, three fifty. We could do this sort of research anywhere. To be fair, yeah. let's go and have a look at Charleston. Let's get some. See, that is that's one hell of a sandwich. What is in that? Salad, ham, cheese. What they, what they would do is put food on it. All I have to do is cut it off. There's three, like, three bits of bread in it, isn't there? It's a club sandwich. Yeah, okay. It's just full of stuff. $4 inclusive. Eight forty-four in the AM. Peak hour. What amazes us is building after building, like this one, for example, that have massive balconies, a lot of them three high, that just face onto the back of another house. Every single street, every single nook and cranny is just so beguiling. It reminds me of Europe a lot. Um, the French Quarter in New Orleans is about the only thing I've seen that compares to it here in America. It's just wonderful. I've seen some places in Europe where they're beautiful, but they're normally much more compacted. Like you might get two or three streets that are idyllic and being round about it is kind of ordinary. But this is a whole town. It's just, yeah, it's quite incredible. I just knew I was on the money with my New Orleans theory. Although most cities over here don't have a French Quarter. We're going to go around and film some of the residential areas that we had a look at last night. It was just simply too dark to do any filming. Even with the wonderful light way they were lit.
Ben House. It was built uh, by the person who did it uh, on the gains of capturing a pirate and therefore making the seas safer. There is the expression marked by words. It actually comes from literally taking the last thing that you say before you die, and that is what they put on your tombstone. There's a tombstone in there from the 1600s that says, I told thee I was ill. <laughs> and one from the 1700s that says, to my darling wife, I know I will rest in peace until we meet again. <laughs> Not into the cotton trade, we actually tried to get into the silk trade. They had to create myrtle trees filled with silkworms and silk cocoons brought over from China. However, the worms and the cocoons did not survive the trip on the ship. The crepe myrtles, however, have flourished here. And they're actually protected by the city. We have crepe myrtle trees that are somewhere between 150 and 200 years old in the city. It's known as creeping figs, sometimes called Japanese creeping figs. And it actually does no damage to the structure. It uses sort of like suction cups to adhere, so you can simply peel it off. It doesn't get into the mortar. And the staircase here on the White House is sometimes known as a welcoming arm staircase. The gentleman would go up the left side, the ladies up the other way. That's another way to prevent seeing of the ankles. My mom was down here for a tour and she told me that that wasn't the correct story, however. The gentleman went up the left side so that he would always remember that a lady was always right. Oh, <laughs> sounds like a plan. It's true, very true. This is a White Point Garden. Uh, it was originally called White Point because it was an oyster bed and oyster shells. And the sailors sailing into the harbor toward the two rivers, they would use it as a navigational tool. After Charles, Charleston itself is only three square miles wide and a third of that is made land. But Bildit said he never wanted to be cornered by a Charleston woman. The front house here is a private residence. The back carriage house is a bed and breakfast. The carriage, battery carriage house in, supposedly haunted with a gentleman ghost. He likes to tickle ladies' feet. When they wake up, he tips his hat and disappears. And the house on the corner was in the Guggenheim family before the Guggenheim Museum opened in New York. Mrs. Guggenheim stored part of her art treasures here and part in Venice, Italy. And uh, the wedding cake house down there, this was Mr. Williams' house, the father's house. So it's still a private residence today, but also an open for house museum. It's the Calhoun Mansion. And the home of John C. Calhoun, despite being built 26 years after he died. The house has been used in a lot of movies. It's just under 25,000 square feet. It is the largest private residence in the city, and it is open for tours. We're not the most attractive young women in Charleston, so their father decided to build them homes to try to get them married off. Oh, oh. He built one for the blonde, the redhead, and the brunette. Did it work? Not sure. <laughs> it's tour guide legend, I've never heard of it. I've heard stories that they all three remain spinsters, but I don't like to tell them. Oh, kind of sad. Dear. I know, that's, I don't want to be sad. Here in Charleston, we also have something known as the Law of 70s. Anything over 70 years old is protected and cannot be touched by the hands of man, only by the hands of God. That's why you'll still see carriage stepping stones, hitching posts, and the trees growing out of the sidewalk and into the street. Because those trees are over 70 years old, we just simply build our sidewalks around or pave the street around them. In the late 90s, they filmed a lot of scenes from the Patriot along here. They filled the roads with dirt make it look like it was back in the day that building there was aunt charlotte's house and the church i think it's a church anyways or the courthouse whatever it is that was where they burned the effigy of king george the second largest house in 
Charleston. We just haven't got time to do it all. Beautiful. The houses in this area were mainly built in the late 1600s, early 1700s. You can buy one for a couple of mil, can't you? Something like that. But just a little one you get for that. That one's a bit older. It's looking north back towards the hotel, which is on this street. That's the biggest house in town apparently, just across the road from the other one and down a little to the south. And we've got a nice little garden in here. Well, the comparisons are always made, as I said before, between Savannah and Charleston. I personally don't think we can really compare. We, we saw more the, um, uh, the recreational side of Savannah, whereas Charleston is mainly residential, would you say? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. And there's more rich people here than there is in Savannah. It looks like it. <laughs> it is stunning, absolutely stunning, and there's not, not one thing out of place. This building at the end of Meeting Place Avenue was owned by the woman who wrote Gone With The Wind. Her name escapes me, unfortunately, right at this moment. It's called the Wedding Cake House. Her father gave her a gift of $75,000 on her wedding day to build the house of her dreams. So the story goes. And it look, would look out over the bay, except all the trees. It's now a bed and breakfast. Our hotel's called the Meeting Street Inn. So I've got a feeling this one would cost just a little more to stay in. Just dripping with southern charm. I thought on the tour that this was my favourite house and having had a closer look at it, I'm absolutely convinced. And BB's going to keep the brochure because next time we come here, you the brochure. we will stay here. The use of columns was obviously very prevalent in the period. The Civil War actually started here in 1861. The 10-inch Rodman. It was from this very spot in 1861, April 14, that the first shots of the Civil War were fired. That way, all the way, two miles that way, to Fort Sumpner. 
basically what happened was that the south were had seceded uh, from the north. Well, there was a few of the there was about ten states down here that seceded, and Lincoln refused to accept the, the, their secession. Anyway, the fort over here, Fort Sumner, was occupied by Union troops, and they were running low on supplies. Now, if Lincoln hadn't have supplied them and, and pulled pulled them out, then that would have been that would have been retreating. That wouldn't have sent a good message to the people of the North, to the people of the Union, who uh, they would have, you know, would have, uh, we're not going to withdraw, you know, what's ours. That was their attitude. So Lincoln, knowing that when he did restock it, uh, resupply Fort Sumner, there, that was an act of war as far as the Confederacy was concerned, and so it proved. And uh, as I say, the first shots of the Civil War were fired from this spot right here. This morning I was uh, wondering aloud about why they have the balconies facing the back of the other house. And we were informed this morning it's because the breeze, to get the breeze, make most use of that, an archaic air conditioning system, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. The house facing a different direction and they can get more of the through draft. I could live here, no doubt about that, but as BB says, oh, yeah. the weather gets severe. It does get severe and it's more a point of whether your house would still be there after the weather. Well, having said that, they have been here for 300 years as it is. Yeah. And the most remarkable thing about it, I reckon, is that it survived the Revolutionary War of the late 1770s and the Civil War of the 1860s, basically intact. There's scars on that sort of stuff, but remarkable. George Washington visited Charleston five times during his eight years as president. Rumour had it that he had a little chicky babe here, more than one maybe. Possibly. Well, we've got to move on, unfortunately. We've got to get over to Darlington and then Charlotte, North Carolina, where our digs are tonight. But it's been wonderful. And as that on it. As out a parting shot of Charleston, BB was enchanted with the enchanting toilet roll holder. Very southern.